Um, I am uh, really thrilled to, um, to introduce our next panel. Um, it's been um, already uh, a very exciting day. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, we take it for granted maybe a little bit, but, but we should step back and recognize that we really have a, a glittering array of very exciting projects and research um, that has really, I think, revolutionized um, how much more sophisticated we can all be when we're thinking about not just the nature of the problem, but even more excitingly, um, the contours of a lot of different solutions. Um, and so I am particularly thrilled to get to take um, a co-host privilege and, and moderate this panel um, and uh, really dig into some thrilling um, research results and programmatic results and, and early findings um, on, um, on programs that are working. Um, and uh, joining me on the panel are uh, to my immediate right, Gail Hillbrand from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Gail's the Associate Director of Consumer Education and Engagement. Uh, she'll be talking about the findings from your report, um, increasing savings at tax time and promising practices for the field. It felt pretty relevant. Uh, uh, next to Gail is um, Other Gail, you know, um, who is not called Other Gail at home, as I recall. Gail 2. Gail 1 and Gail 2, um, for the uh, Dr. Seuss fans. Uh, Gail is a senior fellow at MDRC, and she'll be talking about um, their most recent research findings uh, around Save USA, which you heard a little bit about. And to other Gail's right is Tim Flacca, uh, Executive Director of Doorways to Dreams Fund, who will be talking about their Save Your Refund campaign and um, prize link savings wonderfulness. So with that, I'm just going to shut up and go right to Gail. Thank you. It's Jonathan's fault we're speaking from the uh, podium. So at least I can see those of you who are hiding behind the camera from here. That's nice. Um, I'm going to talk about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's work in tax time savings. Um, my colleague Dave Siminski is leading this work for our Office for Financial Impairment. I asked him to give me an acknowledgement of his work, and he thanked virtually every person in this room. So let me just say, it's Dave Siminski in the Office for Financial Impairment, the CPB that's doing this work. Um, we believe in savings. We believe in it for family economic stability, for opportunity, and for resiliency. And we believe in tax time as a moment to talk about savings and wealth building. But this really predates the CFPB. It's the work that all of you did that caused Congress to put these words in our statute, telling us very directly to be sure we're working on wealth building and savings at tax time, and especially at EITC time. I'm going to do a couple of things with you. I'll give you kind of a quick run through on our goals and approaches. Then I'm going to talk about the results in our four years of working with Vita sites. Then I'll tell you about a randomized control trial we have going on with paid preparers. I'm pretty sure that's why we're invited to speak, but I can't give you the results on that yet because they're not in yet. So I'll just tell you what we hope to learn. And finally, I'll close by telling you a little bit more about the CFPB. If you're in consumer services, things you can do with us, things we have that we hope you will use. So you've already heard that tax time really matters. I'll just add that our financial well-being research shows that people do better across the income spectrum, regardless of income if they ask questions, if they make plans, and if they act on those plans. And that'll be no surprise to any of you who are working in coaching, counseling, and other kinds of service provision. So tax time is a moment when people can make plans and have a real chance to act on those plans. Our own short and medium-term goals are pretty simple. We're trying to help and to learn. So we want to develop a better understanding, not only of what works for consumers, but what works for the providers in the room. And that's all of you running VITA programs and other kinds of community services. It's the best idea in the world that you can't implement is not a very good idea. Um, we also want to learn what more we can do to be helpful now. If you run community service programs, you're thinking, you're from Washington, you want to help me, write a check, and let me go back to my community and get the work done. We are not a grant-making agency, so that makes it a little harder. We have to figure out what else we can provide to you that will help you do this work every day on the ground. Our longer-term goal is a little more ambitious. It's to make sure that every single consumer who's getting a tax refund is offered a conscious opportunity to think about saving a piece of that every year at tax time. And this is uh, ambitious because we've got 110 million households who are getting a refund. And that means if we can move these numbers by just 1% in each of these buckets, that's a million families. And I say we collectively because we're not going to do it all by ourselves in our little agency in Washington. 
we do it together. Uh, we talked about how important the paid providers are, and our most recent numbers suggest it's about 52% of consumers still going to paid providers. So um, for all the fabulous work being done in VITA, we have to reach people not only in the VITA channel, but also in the paid provider channel. So we've identified key audiences, consumers themselves, the online and software preparers, and the in-person industry, both the community service, VITA and the like, and also the tax preparation industry. Now I'm going to go a little bit slower and tell you about what we have been doing. We were just started in 2011, after tax season uh, was just about done. We, in 2012 and 2013, put up some posters and provided some scripts for VITA programs to use, and our program became more substantial in 14 and 15. I want to highlight for you two results here. 2.75% of people who filed through VITA sites that worked with us in 14 and 15 were splitting their refunds. The national average is only 1.5, so that's actually a pretty substantial increase. And 2% signed up for savings bonds, and again, the national average is about 1%, and that's overall taxpayers, not just VITA taxpayers. So I want to really focus in a little bit on this slide and what we have learned so far, and I say learned very specifically because most of the creativity here is coming from those of you who are running sites around the country and have been generous in sharing with us your knowledge about what works and what doesn't. So this slide illustrates, and if I were a professor, I'd have a little picture and you could see it move around, um, six different touch points where people hear about savings at the VITA campaigns that we're working with. They walk in the door and see a poster. They walk in to register and get some kind of mild information about savings. They sit down and there's a video. Then this step number four, this person you see in the center before people go in to get their uh, taxes done is actually really important. This is the savings specialist. It's a volunteer or a staffer whose sole job is to talk about savings and to put that idea into the person's head before, or to facilitate what might already be there, before they go in to sit down with the preparer. A um, great program we're working with in Ohio, we went out to visit them for something else, and the executive director said to me, we're so committed to savings and VITA tax time, we only do it on Wednesdays, not on Saturdays, because we're just too busy on Saturdays, and we have too much of a backlog. And that um, comment, reminded us that you have to put extra personnel. So those of you who are funding in this area, somebody's got to pay for those folks. And for those of you who are thinking about the number of volunteers that you need, please think about that person who can help to anchor the consumer in this thought before they get in to their turn that they've been waiting for with the preparer. Step number five is with their preparer, where there will be prompts and questions to ask. And step number six, when the return is being reviewed for quality, is an opportunity to congratulate the person who has made that choice to do some savings. Uh, we're not in this alone. We've learned a great deal from the work you've already heard about from Intuit and the Center for Social Development, uh, also from Save Your Refund and the Doorways to Dream, Save USA, and some of the folks you're going to hear from later. Tim, I have to think of you as the not Gail on our panel. So. <laughs> and many of these folks have been in this field much longer than we have. We did put out a report last year based on what we have learned so far through uh, for the 14 and 15 work. Uh, and the purpose is really to help every VITA site in the country look at a list of practices that your colleagues are using that are working for them and say to yourself, which ones do I want? Which ones might work? Some of these practices require organizational buy-in and staffing. Some are things that individual volunteers and staff can do. At around the time we're putting this together, CSD was putting together its toolkit. And while the report and the toolkit take somewhat different approaches, if you put them down side by side, they give you a very good set of things to think about for your own programs. So I'm going to talk about the 10 promising practices. There'll be a different 10 from the ones you heard from my colleague earlier. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing in 16. Um, we find, and the programs we're working with have told us, communicating with consumers before they come into the tax site really matters. Offering that option more than once at the tax site matters. Making sure the preparers know about the nuts and bolts. Well, did you bring your savings account information with you? How else can we make sure people know what to do in that moment? Item four we talked about already, that's touch point four, having a real person right there whose only job is to help facilitate savings at the site. Anchoring and prompts matter a lot. And I put out at the table at the front this entire report and also um, the anchoring worksheet that we provide to VITA sites. 
we, the programs told us it's really important. It can't just be one person who's enthusiastic about it. It has to really be an organizational uh, understanding for all the staff and volunteers that this is part of the job that's being done that year. We find that giving people too many choices actually makes it a little harder. Incentives and gamification, making it fun. You'll hear more about that from the Not Gale, who was more of a specialist in fun than I. You can find this report if you didn't pick it up at consumerfinance.gov, the Office of Financial Empowerment webpage. So for this tax season, we're working with 41 campaigns in 25 communities around the country. Each one has applied to be uh, considered and has committed to do something. We're offering the set of good practices and saying, you pick the ones that work for you and commit to giving us information about which ones you used and what your savings results were. And we'll be putting out a new paper on that um, after the end of this tax season. We'll also be doing a convening of those pilot sites and others who asked to be included. So if you have a special interest in being part of that, please do let us know. Uh, this year, we put a uh, savings insert into 11 million envelopes for those folks who still get paper checks. We've done this in the past, but not with a specific savings message. And then I want to tell you a little bit about paid preparers, those 52% of people. We have a randomized control trial with H&R Block. There are three big steps that are happening there. 400,000 consumers getting email and an equal size control group who are not, that we're looking at both. 25 stores where people are getting, the preparers are being trained, and another 25 where they're not. And gamification, which Tim will talk about a little more. We have done a survey, and we're in the field for the second year with the same work. We do expect to have results this summer, uh, but I can't tell you about them yet, so please stay tuned on those. We are deeply committed to MyRA, and I'm not going to tell you again, you just heard about that. But where else can you not worry about losing your money and not pay a single fee? Finally, if you are in the, if you're running a Vita site, if you're in consumer services, chances are you're doing a lot of other important things in your community in addition to Vita. So think about other places where the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau can be helpful to you. Ask CFPB at consumerfinance.gov. There's 1,000 questions and answers about uh, money topics from as simple as what's the difference between a credit report and a credit score to as complicated as how do I talk to my 10-year-old about money, where should I start? We take complaints, and if the people you serve are not bringing their problems forward to the CFPB, then the people you serve will not be getting their fair share of the government's attention in this important area. So people can complain at consumerfinance.gov and at 855-411-CFPB. Some people get their money back. Every one of those complaints also informs how we spend our regulatory time, and that's really important for the people who we all serve. You can visit us. And you can also sign up for the Empowerment Newsletter. We won't spam you. You'll get it maybe every other month. It'll tell you what we're doing in the tax space and in related spaces. So thank you for your work. We are in the business of learning from you and trying to pass that information back out to the rest of the field. It's been an extraordinary privilege to be on this journey with you. Okay, for the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, give you a quick overview of the final uh, impact or what we call effectiveness findings from the Save USA evaluation. Um, this is an evaluation that was conducted by MDRC of the Save USA program. And for those of you not familiar with MDRC, um, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan social research organization. Um, our goal is to use research to improve the lives of low income individuals. Um, I directed the uh, Save USA study at MDRC, but uh, several other evaluation team members are here today, and uh, what I'm going to say reflects really their hard work. Uh, the Save USA program and its evaluation uh, were funded through the Federal Social Innovation Fund. This is a program uh, run by the Corporation for National and Community Service and a number of uh, foundations and organizations shown here 
provided the matching funds for this effort. Um, this is a requirement of the SIF. Uh, so what is Save USA? Uh, Save USA was designed to address one of the issues that many of the other speakers today have focused on. Um, less than half of low to moderate income individuals have emergency savings of $500 or more. Um, Save USA encourages low and moderate income uh, tax filers to directly deposit tax refunds into savings into a special ac account. And the savings can be used to pay for unexpected or emergency expenses or really for any other purpose. Uh, specifically, Save USA offers people um, who are filing their taxes at VITA sites the opportunity um, to directly deposit $200 uh, to $1,000 of their tax refunds into a special savings account and then receive a 50% match um, on their pledged savings if they maintain their deposit for about a year. And then annually, they can uh, deposit tax refund dollars and be eligible uh, for save subsequent savings matches. Uh, some of the features of the Save USA model were meant to um, mimic a federal tax credit proposal, which was being developed for uh, low and moderate income tax filers in 2011, which is when Save USA started. It was patterned, as others have mentioned, um, on a Save NYC program. And um, this federal tax credit proposal back then is fairly similar to what um, uh, Representative Serrano was describing early this morning. So by design, um, this um, program offered no additional services, such as financial counseling. Uh, the match was paid out once a year, as would be the case um, in a um, tax code embedded program. And even small withdrawals resulted in the loss of the match. There were a number of partners involved here um, shown in this slide. Notably, the program was operated in four cities, New York City, Tulsa, Newark, and San Antonio. Uh, the Save USA research uh, consisted of an implementation study as well as a randomized controlled trial in New York City and Tulsa. And we particularly focused on people who enrolled um, in the program in 2011, and then essentially we followed them through 2014. And to examine the effects of Save USA compared to what would have happened in the absence of Save USA, we randomly assigned individuals in two cities to either a Save USA group eligible to open the accounts and earn matches or a regular tax filer group not eligible uh, for Save USA, but they could deposit tax dollars in other kinds of savings product, products. And so this design ensured that the individuals in the two research groups were comparable when they entered the study. So any differences we saw over time between these two groups, we'll, which we'll look at in just a minute, we can confidently attribute to the Save USA program. So just quickly, uh, to be in Save USA, you had to be willing to be in the study, have an adjusted gross income of the amount at or below the amounts shown here, and anticipate at least a $200 refund. Uh, in our sample, we had over 2,500 people, the majority of whom were female. Over half had dependent children, and their average AGI was $18,000. We used a number of data sources, baseline data, account activity, and data from two follow-up surveys given to people at 18 and 42 months after they enrolled. Um, we had an 80% response rate, which was very high. So what did we find? Um, well, in terms of implementation, uh, you can look at this chart uh, where we're looking at the 2011 enrollees in the three years of the program uh, that were studied as part of the evaluation. 
And as you see in the first column, most people opened an account in the first year. About two-thirds kept their original pledged savings amount in their account, got a match the following February. And if you go across all three program years, the average match for these individuals was $365. Just among the people who received at least one match, it was $540. Uh, partic participation decreased after year one. In year three, for example, about one in four of these individuals put money into their uh, Save USA accounts when they filed their taxes. So what did we find in terms of the impacts or effectiveness of the program? Um, to measure the effects, we took advantage of the very strong random assignment design that uh, I talked about a minute ago. The red bars in this slide, as well as the next few slides, um, show what happened to the regular tax filers or control group members, what, that is what happened in the absence of Save USA, and the blue bars show the Save USA group. So quickly what you see here is about 47% of the Save USA group directly deposited tax refund dollars into a savings account in year three of the program, the most recent year um, that they filed taxes. This is an increase of about five percentage points. We also found that Save USA increased the percent of people at this three and a half year follow up point who had non retirement savings, and this is of any type, anything they considered to be savings, money at home, minimum balance in their checking account. We also found that Save USA increased the amount of savings that people had, an increase of $522, which represented about a 30% increase above the regular tax filers. Um, we also found that Save USA increased some aspects of support for savings, particularly the percent of people who reported having a savings goal. We also looked um, at other outcomes that were hypothesized to perhaps be affected by savings if savings were in fact increased. And I'll go through this very quickly uh, because I think I'm running out of time. But we found basically that Save USA had no positive or negative effects on debt. Um, we also found, however, that Save USA had no positive or negative effects on the use of high cr cost credit. Um, also, surprisingly, we found it didn't have any positive or negative effects on the likelihood of people reporting that they had a financial hardship. And these effects were consistent across a lot of subgroups. Um, so what did we conclude? Um, Save USA definitely led to sustained increases um, in non-retirement savings, so it did have behavioral effects. Um, but we think that match say and we think match savings programs like Save USA can be included in a toolkit of savings initiatives for low and middle income middle income families. But we also think, as others uh, presenters have said earlier, that other interventions are needed to further improve the financial situations of um, low and middle income families. Basically. Other interventions are needed to improve and increase their income. So you can find out more about Save USA on the MDRC website. And with that, I'll close. Look at that. All right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I just want to start by acknowledging that we are all sitting in a room with no windows in the middle to late afternoon after a long day. So you would be forgiven if your energy is flagging, and I can only promise to try to talk really fast and maybe really loudly to compensate <laughs> um, possible threats of interactive activities if there are too many nodding heads. Um, OK, um, I think we all deserve a snack to get started. So um, this is, is what I'll offer you. Um, 
We have been doing a lot of thinking at DDD about what we think of as consumer engagement. And so I, I saw a lot of relevance to the tax conversation. I wanted to start with this. And there are a lot of ideas contained in this framework of consumer engagement. But what it really comes down to is that you know, we all tend to be motivated by a sense of, of doing right by people. And sometimes that can temporarily blind us to the fact that we are competing for people's attention um, on a, in a very busy marketplace. Um, and what we really want, we would submit, the sort of North Star, the Holy Grail, is for people to want whatever it is that we have to offer them. And why? Well, number one, it's a whole lot easier to grow and scale things if people desire what you have, of course. But two, in a lot of ways, I would put out there that we're all in the behavior change business. And I would further submit that if you're trying to get somebody to do something, even if it's something they, they're already basically convinced is in their interest, if they're showing up voluntarily and enthusiastically, you have a lot more to work with. Um, so this will not always be possible. I think it's really, really, really hard to produce things that people want and that are also good for them. Goodness knows there's an entire economy looking for you know, new stuff to make us, let me try that again, to looking to introduce new stuff that we will all want and buy, right? And we have the extra challenge of trying to not just make stuff that's desirable but also good for us. Um, but I wanted to put this out just as a, as a starting point. And I think, you know, what engagement comes down to in the simplest form is are people using the things that we put out there and probably the single uh, simplest metric there is take up. And as I thought about you know, having the chance to come and, and talk with all of you today and reflected on our own work in this space, you know, I just, we see really three drivers of take up. So I wanted to share that framework in case it's helpful for folks. And as you can see, those are incentive. And is Dave Williams still in the room with his discussion of rational man, right? This is our rational man theory. Um, you know, what sort of financial bribe or financial incentive will cause you to try something? Uh, the second one is product. So it turns out that what people are offered to save in matters. In fact, we've run uh, pilot tests over a number of years. We first started by saying, why don't you just split your refund and put some into savings and some into, into spending? The next year, then we offered US savings bonds. We actually saw take-up rates rise dramatically. That's not conclusive, but I think there's a case to be made that sometimes what product you put out there for people to save in has a significant impact on how likely they are to actually save. And the last one is, is you could call it promotion for a fancy word, but it's really the ask. What is the nature and the way in which somebody is asked to save? And I think we've had some good discussion here about the difference between scalable, low-touch, you know, uh, high, high reach ways of asking through, for example, TurboTax. Those of you from the VITA world would be quite familiar with more what I think Gail One's diagram depicted. Um, I will say in, in our work, we have seen um, the highest variability around this question of ask, right? We have run pilots where we will see next to zero take up in one facility and in another facility, 23, 24% take up. And even when you normalize for the population, you know, the single largest explanation is probably the quality and the nature of that person delivering the ask. So that's interesting. Just two other quick points on this slide. Um, again, just listening to all of the kind of great stuff that people are talking about today, I'm struck that we are still trying to figure these things out, right? We're still messing around with what's the right form of incentive, not to say that there's only one. We're still seeing new products being introduced. Today we heard some, you know, great explanation of my RA. Oh, this is bad. I've got five minutes left. I'm on slide two. All right, we'll turn up the speed. Um, and uh, of course, the R2S work is around the ask. So uh, here are four things that, that we've seen that seem to really matter. Um, make it easy for people to save, make it stand out, or maybe better said, make it fun. Uh, incentives do matter, rational man notwithstanding, and product choice really matters. So let me walk through some of these. Um, first of all, in terms of easy, this ability to split your refund is foundational. This is the mechanism that allows us to make a decision at the moment of tax filing that we want to allocate funds for savings. And the incredible thing is the government will enact that for us at no cost, right? It's available to everybody. So that's a really important, just a piece of foundation for savings. The second thing is um, 
as we thought about, you know, that's not enough though, right? It can't be just easy. We need to somehow grab people's attention. That's led us to produce a uh, savior refund. And this is offering people a chance to win prizes for committing some of their refund to savings. And we do that, there are over 100 prizes. They range in value from 100 bucks to a grand prize is $25,000. But this injects an element of interest and excitement and helps again stand out or make saving fun. Incidentally, not just for tax filers, but also for tax preparers. Um, save your refund, we've been doing it several years now, and I think the, the takeaway is that um, when people find out about it, it is very uh, motivational. So we've seen a lot of growth, both in terms of enrollment and also in terms of dollars saved. Beyond just people using this promotion, we have also found that 74% of people who use it tell us they did not even know they had the ability to split their refund. 83% had never used the form before. So this appears to be an, an important mechanism to make people aware of the tools they have. Also, 83% uh, decided to do it because their tax preparer asked them. In this uh, current tax season, we are expanding Save Your Refund through a partnership with America Saves. So I'm sure how many people are familiar with America Saves? Okay, run by Consumer Federation of America. Um, so Save Your Refund is now available in 872 community tax sites around the country. And as Gail One mentioned, we're uh, working with um, working with H and R Block as part of the CFPB's research to offer Save Your Refund to 400,000 tax clients and in person. That's through email in person into their district offices. Uh, but I want to take a moment to talk about product because this is something I think is really really important. It's a truism that we don't save if we don't have what a place to save, right? Um, it's even more the case, David, I assume that body language is validating. So you're joking about first you got to have the money and then Oh, okay, all right, yeah. <laughs> That's off message. No. <laughs> um, but this is especially important for, for low income or financially vulnerable people. Without a product, you're not going to save. Um, and we believe that a public product set Right? So my array that we've heard about today, but also U.S. savings bonds, which is something we've spent a lot of time working on, are really critical. And let me give you three reasons why. Uh, first of all, there are gaps in the private market. Uh, if you have 50 bucks to save somewhere and you don't want to pay a lot of fees, there are not a lot of private providers who want to do business with you. And that's just a fact. Uh, the second reason is that there is a huge signaling effect by having your federal government in the business of delivering savings products. Things that we value as a society, government tends to be involved in, right? Public safety, we have an expectation that government plays a role in the delivery of public safety. Uh, when it comes to education, we have an expectation that this is a shared interest of ours so that government will be involved in the delivery of education. That's not to say that some of us won't go out and purchase private education or private security guards, and that's fantastic. But if you're a low-income person, knowing that the government is in the business, of offering high quality, safe, affordable savings products has an important signaling effect. And finally, if we've heard discussion of this today, I think we'll probably hear more in the next panel, the direction is only of more activity and dollars flowing through the tax code system. And if we wanna build savings through that policy lever, I think all of us who care about low income people have a strong interest in making sure that there is a high quality set of universally available products to link up to those flows of tax credits and tax deductions. Um, so public products, very important. Savings bonds, again, something we've spent a lot of time on. Uh, they are a remarkable product with a long history and a special affinity among many of the populations we're trying to serve. Um, it turns out that, uh, that the connection between tax time and savings products, public products, exists today only in the form of US savings bonds and for various reasons that do not have to do with the merits of the product that is under threat. So Congress has introduced a bill. It's now in, in both the Senate and the House. Uh, it's a one-page bill. It's very short, and it simply says, don't break this link between public products and tax time savings until you have a new way to deliver uh, something like a savings bond. Don't take away the system that exists today. I encourage you to look at it. And finally, but when we think about public savings products, and I think we got a flavor of this from Melissa Coity, we shouldn't fall into the trap of assuming this is our father's Oldsmobile or something that was from a generation ago. There is ample opportunity for innovation that brings sectors together. There's no reason in the world, in theory, 
that you shouldn't be able to buy a MyRA account or a US savings bond on a gift card when you go to the mall and you look for a gift for a new niece or you know, child or whatever it is. There's no reason that you shouldn't be able to access these products, not only through mobile technology, but through partners in the private sector. The use of APIs, these secure data links, can allow this entire sort of explosion of activity that's um, represented by Silicon Valley to serve as a distribution system and an acquisition of customers system and link it into these public products. We've had informal conversations with innovators who are excited about doing that, and we think that's a way that this kind of public product can be brought forward into the 21st century. Okay, I think I am out of time, so I won't uh, offer you any more reflections, but is it back to you now, Jonathan? Great. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks. So I'm going to invite audience questions, and while I do that, I'm, I'm going to uh, jump in. Um, it strikes me again and again when I think about what you all have been talking about and what we were talking about all day that, um, that these conversations have become much more sophisticated, much more specific, and feel much more um, uh, human-centered. Um, uh, we have a better sense of what motivates people, and what's really going on in their lives, and we're talking in a much more specific way. So I have two questions that come from that observation. One is, um, is this more sophisticated approach to trying to affect savings a fad? Um, or does it represent, do you think, an evolution um, in engagement? And then uh, related to that, my other question is, um, does a more sophisticated way of trying to connect and engage um, make it easier or harder, do you think, for policymakers to get it and buy it? Uh, with some hesitation, I'll go first on that with the last question. I think in policy, it's especially important to realize that the person making the policy is actually not the target audience who's going to benefit from that policy. The Bureau, we're deeply invested in user research because what works on me it might not work on the person who you're serving or might not work on all of the different subgroups of people who we are all serving. So really starting from what the customer wants in their own life and what's going to be effective for them is tremendously important. I don't think this is a fad because all this talk about behavioral economics, it's great science, it's, it's fascinating, it's interesting, but marketers have known how to do this for centuries. And um, we know in this country that about $25 uh, dollars is spent on marketing of financial services products for every one dollar that's spent on financial education. We have to make that one dollar go farther by using some of these same techniques. I mean, I would just offer, if you think about my Rubik's Cube slide, um, a point I meant to make that I think is on point here is that it's not that there's one answer, that if we just figure out the right product and the right incentive and the right way of asking people that then we're right, you know? I think a more uh, realistic way to think about it is that consumers are complicated and they exist in many different points in life and with different values and priorities and what we're really after is to figure out how to match the right set of incentives and product and ask with the right consumer, right? Someone who is not interested in retirement and that's not kind of on their mind, offering them a, a product that says retirement and an incentive structure that's built around retirement and using the language and the framing of retirement is not necessarily going to land um, so to tie it to your first question, I, I feel like that kind of insight is not a fad. I think we've made progress in understanding that sort of nuance of who the market is. Um, and then the final comment, and everyone will have their own opinion on this, but some of the big drivers of this conversation around inequality, um, those don't feel like fad issues to me. Those feel like generational issues that are going to take a long time. So we may you know, ebb and flow in terms of our appetite to talk about them, but I think the real drivers of the conversation are going to be with us. Uh, I'm going to go again, uh, but invite people to step up to the microphone and, and, and tee up a question if you have one. Um, the other, um, when I think back to when we started this work uh, back in New York City government uh, for ourselves, um, one of the early myths that we needed to bust um, was the idea that um, trying to help a population that was drowning in debt think about the future um, was sort of putting the cart before the horse. Um, I think. Together, we've all shown that's not true. Um, but for many, that was a real, um, as I say, a real myth buster. It was an opportunity to step back and say, um, 
this defies our expectations and, and changes the landscape of the possible. I'm wondering in each of your work what you have seen um, to be the real um, happy surprise or instructive surprise um, that you think is a pivot point uh, for propelling your work forward. I'm going to go last on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Other Gail? Hmm. Hmm. Well, let me think. Um, we had a lot of surprises, I think, um, in the Save USA research. Um, going back a little bit to the previous question, um, we could see in our databases that people were saving in a variety of ways, a lot of different patterns, a lot of different products. So. Um, I'm not sure if this was a big surprise to us, but I'll just echo the, the comments that others made. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's one, one thing that's going to work for everyone. I think, the, you know, a variety of things, we've kind of called it a toolkit of approaches, and, you know, some things are one tool, and that toolkit um, will, um, will work. But um, let me think a little bit was, more about I surprises. Was about that too. You said, when you were sort of prompting the audience, um, you know, what's the one thing you need, you know, to, to move forward here? And, and there was a sort of a, a pause from the audience. Um, and I think it's not just because uh, there's no uh, natural light, but um, also because there are so many different vantage points to answering that question, right? And, and that's the realities of the complexity here, but also um, the realities of the opportunities. Uh, I was in a room once in Washington where they pulled together people that had a bunch of fun and promising programs and they were aimed at the tax code and said, okay, well, let's all agree on, and put our energy behind one really good idea. Um, and that was not going to happen. Um, and it was not going to happen for a number of reasons, one of which was that there were a lot of promising practices that all felt like um, key pieces of the puzzle. Um, you know, you're you're like the the, the hip piece of the puzzle um, with gamification. Oh, we're in trouble. Uh, yeah, well, 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 the, the the now institutionalized hip part of the of the puzzle. Um, and so I wonder what you've seen that's really surprised you. Well, I guess I mean we'll see if this answers that question or not. But one thing that we we certainly have discovered over the years is that on this question of should you save when you're in debt, that at least for people who are parents, there is a sense that the next generation is a clean slate. And that my life may be, my financial life may be beyond repair, but you know, my offspring, or maybe it's my niece or my nephew, but that sort of next generation represents um, a wise investment, even at a time where kind of my financial life is messed up. So I, I think that is something for us all to remember, um, both the specific lesson, but also like that's sort of an example of a possibly easy to overlook motivational hook, right, that really resonated with people. We want to keep our eyes open for that. And then the second thing I would say, and I'd, again, I'd be curious if people share this, but people have a pretty native sense that saving is a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not, we're not really trying to sell people on something that they don't already feel. Mm -hmm. um, our task is to, is to make it easy and to kind of, you know, help people to act on that impulse that they have pretty deeply. Um, it's just a subtly different frame that I think is useful. I'm ready now. I'd like to just oh, add on oh, there. Great. I think that this point about what your kids see is amazingly important. People bring their kids when they're doing financial transactions. They bring their kids to the Vita site. If they're not bringing them in, there's still something to talk about at home. You remember the I get blood today sticker? Some of the sites are using I save today. Um, that moment of being able to say to your kids, I did this for you. I did this for us. I did this for our family is a really important moment, not just for the amount that's saved, but for the pride and for the self-determination that goes into it. And the financial well-being work that we're doing, we ask a lot of adults who are happy with their financial lives, what, the, what you know, those feelings of control, feelings of freedom now and in the future, but a number of them said, someone in my life talked to me about money. And we're encouraging parents to talk to their kids about money. You don't have to be an expert. You can say, I would have done it differently and here's what I would have done differently, or you can say, here's what I would do the same, here are the small steps that we take every day as a family. And that, there's a power in that that you don't get from putting an extra 10 bucks on your credit card. Although I was very inspired by the conversation of the earlier panel, which is paying down debt is another way to create room in your household balance sheet. It can be a form of savings as well. Uh, hi, Tim Ogden from the Financial Access Initiative and the U.S. Financial Diaries. Um, I, Gail, I'm, I'm interested in sort of the MDRC results and the fact that we skipped over the it didn't actually make any difference in these people's lives. 
uh, and overall for this um, for the question that maybe well, you actually should be convincing people against their intuitions toward savings and getting them to pay down more debt because it is, from an economic perspective, pretty obvious that most of these families would be actually much better off if they took that money and paid down debt because they're carrying a lot of high cost debt instead of saving it at very, very low interest rates. So, uh, you know, given that, uh, all of this thinking about, hey, what, what they're getting back in the tax refund is their savings already. Let's stop worrying about getting them to save their savings. Let's get them to pay down their debt and let's uh, use all of this time and effort to work those people on debt and, and, and get people to automatic tax filing instead of spending all this time with TurboTax. Well, I guess, um, you know, we were evaluating the effects of the Save USA initiative. Um, I, you know, I, I, I can't really extrapolate to say, okay, what if we would have instead, uh, what would we have seen if we would have instead um, studied something that was focused on paying down debt? Um, I can say that um, at the beginning of the project, there was um, worry on both sides in terms of the debt issue, that some people would actually increase their debt in order to keep their pledged savings amount you know, in their account for a year and get a, essentially a 50% interest um, on, on that amount, interest rate. Um, other people thought, okay, if you save, you'll have more money to pay down the debt. So there were, you know, original hypotheses going both ways. Um, and as you saw on the slide, we saw no effect on debt. Um, you know, I, I really can't say what, you know, what is the best thing to do about debt. I will say at the end of the study, um, the people in our sample, so this would have been um, about three and a half years after we first started to follow them, they were in very precarious financial situations. Um, on average, they had about $2,000 coming in each month, and this included from public or government benefits. Um, and on average, they had $10,000 in debt. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not sure I would defer to other people uh, in the audience who have studied this uh, much more than I have to, you know, to, to talk about best ideas for putting that, those figures together. I can't recall if it, it came up in your presentation or if I had just seen it before, but even, even for the people in these precarious situations, what percent of them continued to save or it, comparatively more than people who had not been part of the program, even after the program went, went, went uh, um, It was about a seven percentage point increase in the percent of people who were saving, and this was after the program was over, essentially. So there was something about the program that led people to continue to save, not necessarily, I mean, some of them could keep their Save USA accounts if they wanted, but you know, they weren't going to get another match. Many people were saving in other kinds of products, but you know, it was an increase in the percent of people who were saving. Great. We have a couple more minutes. If there's one more question. We have one more question. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was just coming back on that generational, um, uh, and, uh, I guess, in influence you were saying, actually as one of my sisters, 15 years old, and actually has a 757 credit score, because I try to teach her about finance myself, because nobody really taught me. Um, and sort of this is more of a product question, also, also as well to your research that Gail did. did I, didn't see, I didn't see anything in the chart that sort of measured the people that actually, the, well, the low-income individuals that received public assistance, because I know working as, uh, having six years as a vital volunteer, now doing financial counseling, oh, before the first Stuyvesant, what I saw is that sometimes when I talk to the people that I do virtual taxes now, uh, as far as saving, or even just counseling as far as savings goes, they are really reluctant because they say, if I have a certain amount in my savings account, they will take those benefits away, right? Um, $2,000 is not really gonna outweigh the benefit that they get from public service, because at the end of the day, they're still making about maybe 15 or even $16,000, right? As far, now, as far as you know, trying, to pro, um, tr trying to sell them on the products, how would you go about that? Well, in Save USA, this was an issue that everyone involved was worried about at the beginning. Um, and I think we did get some waivers um, in some of the states where our research cities were located where they would not count any assets in the Save USA account against eligibility um, for uh, um, public benefits. Um, but I think 
this is this is an issue. This is an issue. It certainly highlights an important part of, of, of that equation. H have you run into any impact uh, in your work, Tim, With on asset limits? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that we have, you know, it, it is one of those things where it's hard to know, right, when it's on right. people's minds. It's certainly an issue that we think about and has come up in other parts of our work as well. Um, you know, I, I am struck, but I'm not sure we need to get into it, but, you know, there are rules around EITC being exempt from some of these, and, but the bigger issue, of course, is who can tell, right, and, and what's the chilling effect of not knowing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a thorny one. Uh, Okay, thank you so much to the panel. Thank you for all of you.